Greetings, programs. My name is Brandish Gilhelm, and this is Runehammer. Welcome back to Runehammer. This is episode 11 of RPG Talks, and we are going to talk about a colossal topic, namely the art of escalation. Now let's cue that uh, cue that intro music. Could you? Mm-hmm. All right, Rumenhammerians, my lumpy-headed legion, we are back, and let's just get right into this. Uh, I'm going to save mailbag for next week. Episode 12, we're going to do all mailbag all the time. So um, in the following week, uh, this coming week and weekend, please don't hesitate to send in any questions or ideas for topics. Um, you can either email them to me at hankerin.furnailgmail.com or you can send them right to me directly on Facebook Messenger at runehammer.games. You know the deal. Don't steal. Got to keep it real. Feeling pensive and feeling very uh, intellectual this morning. And so it's going to be a good time to tackle a really big topic. And this one has been a, a, on a slow boil, but I have to send a big thank you out to Jason Scranton, who's been a tremendously active force in ICRPG. He's uh, just a prolific RPG hobbyist and that every week he's got some new craziness that he is dreaming up or excited about. And lately he has taken on the ignominious, if not magnanimous task of attempting to translate or convert or prepare the legendary Rapun Athuk mega dungeon into ICRPG. Now I'm sure that he's not going to do every single room and every single monster and organized in giant tables and all this kinds of stuff. But I think his intention is what's so pure and so fascinating and so useful for us here at Runehammer, which is, I have this piece of content. I want to play it. What's next? And we've got a lot to cover on this topic because it has so many different sides. This is a, this is a tesseract topic because on the one hand, you could be brutish about it and sort of say... My simple mantra that I say with conversion and homebrew, which you guys probably know well about me, which is do whatever you want to do. Don't worry about converting. You can take anything from any game, get a little bit of an idea seed out of it, maybe a couple of little stat blobs, which are just, what are those anyway? And just jam them into your game and see what happens and go from there, right? But for the sake of this talk, I wanted to get into... What's really going on with escalation? And that doesn't just mean what's in this piece of content that's so delicious that you've loved maybe for years that you want to capture in a new system. Dear Lord, I think a a small starship just went by. This is a more nuanced question. The question of escalation has more to it than the simple question of conversion. Now, I also need to send a quick shout out out to Gary and Victor at the Murder Hobo podcast. Now, they did a great talk um, about a week ago about conversion, specifically about converting to ICRPG, but it really sort of morphed into a more abstract conversation about thoughts and methods when you are converting. And I just thought that they had a lot to say because I know Victor is a a conversion crazy. Um, And so that was also part of what initiated this talk about the art of escalation. And so I guess I just want to throw my nickel in the hat and see if it can help illuminate not only the method of taking content and bringing it into ICRPG, which I think is one of the biggest fun things about the system, is that it can be very simple and fun and rewarding. 
but also the art of escalation in and of itself, regardless of system, regardless of conversion, but the actual why escalation is even a topic or a thing worth thinking about. So prepare your minds, join me in taking two deep breaths, and let's dive into this. To begin the conversation, to understand why escalation is such an important topic in our hobby, I would like to bring up what I see as the two sides of the hobby, of, of the stuff we do. This is, this is of gameplay content, not necessarily, you know, visual aids and, and physical artifacts that we create for our hobby, but the actual substance of what plays out in the night. And to me, this is split into two pieces, and they correspond to two different parts of our brains, which behave in wildly different ways. The first one is mainly the purview of the player, and this is the limbic system. Now, I don't know if you guys had this, but I had a funny record when I was a kid all about the human brain. And there was a song on there called Limbic System, and it goes, The limbic system tells you when you're sad, when you're afraid, and when you're glad, if you're fierce like a lion or you're peaceful as a dove. The limbic system makes you love the things that you love. <laughs> Ah, uh, yes, the days when we learned about the human brain on vinyl records. The limbic system is the part of your mind or the multiple parts of your mind that make you want. You want things and you have emotional needs and desires, but you also have emotional responses. Things hit you. Things reach your heart. The limbic system is another way of describing that feeling of your heart. How there are moments when you're overwhelmed with, with emotion or with feeling or response. And there are moments where you're, you're drowning in this, this wanting. You know, I really want to get to that high level. I want to get to that moment where the Raven Queen and I are equals and I'm an immortal and my character has all this history. And I want to feel that as an RPG player. I want to get there. That's your limbic system doing that. And the limbic system to me is this purview of players where they they dwell in the realm of what more reductively could be called the audience they they want to experience things and namely most importantly they want to experience emotional responses and events that are directly entangled with their fate so to me limbic statements of the mind are all very player-driven statements like, I hit him. Oh my God, I'm so uber now. Or, oh geez, this monster is like unkillable. Or, oh, you guys, are you seeing this? This is some high-level shit right here. <laughs> or a great limbic one is, this fight is hopeless, you guys. This is hopeless. We got to get out of here. Uh, the opposite of that in a limbic statement for a player would be like, these guys are just mooks, right? But it's this feeling of like, I'm a badass and these guys just aren't powerful and let's just cream them. You know, so all these little statements fall into the limbic or player driven brain. OK, so that's the first one to consider. Now, on the exact opposite side, we have the cognitive system. Now, this is far easier to understand. The cognitive system is the part of our brain that resolves things. And in specific relevance to this talk, the cognitive system is the game designer brain that uses rules, limitations, notes and descriptions, dice mechanics and math to resolve the limbic desires. So do you see the limbic system is in some ways erratic, it's wanting, it's almost impetuous, it's, it's free, it's psychological. Whereas the cognitive system is scratching its chin, nodding with devious satisfaction as numbers, limitations, preparations, and variables all create more limbic responses. So you can see why the cognitive system is in, in many ways easier to understand. It is the art of being a game designer. Okay, so seeing these two sides of the brain in our hobby gives us, to me, what is 
game design. Game design is the nebular gas cloud that exists between these two behaviors or brain systems that interconnects them. The limbic experiencer or responder is connected via all these tendrils to the cognitive side, and those tendrils are the game design. Those tendrils are why you can't just do everything. Stories about infinitely powerful creatures get old very quickly. (laughs) But stories about creatures that can't do anything get old even faster. Somewhere in between is a game design where you can do some things. And so many people come into the hobby and like to stay on the limbic side. You are a player and we salute you. Most of what the RPG mainframe that is Runehammer is concerned with is the cognitive system on the other side of the cloud of tendrils, which is entirely focused on harnessing, entertaining, shocking, surprising, and terrifying that limbic creature and using this cloud of game design to do so. Now, Hankerin, this is insane, dude. Are you talking about like the two sides of the brain or something like what is come on get to the point dude like i thought we were going to talk about escalation we are going to talk about escalation the two sides of the hobby to me are crucial to understanding what escalates so often when we're looking at escalation we think to ourselves you know in regards to rpgs well that's leveling up right there's more hit points there's more damage you know spells last longer monsters have more capabilities players start to acquire feats and talents and more skills and they get they get more gear and so they become more powerful and they have more resistances and they can endure more but what really happens what really happens now if All you ever had for challenges in your RPG world was level one goblins. And yet the players were allowed to escalate as if normal. They were allowed to level up. They were getting free hit points. They were getting double damage. They were getting new feats that would triple their damage and chain attacks. Then they're getting gear that makes them immune to small amounts of damage, makes them resist different types of elementality, gives them regenerative powers, gives them damage boosting powers then what happens as an escalation in this world? I think you can all visualize it, right? The players become slaughterers. It becomes a massacre of goblins. That is true escalation. But here's what's strange, you guys, and here is where the interesting part of the game design cloud becomes so nuanced, is that the monsters and the challenges are also escalating. And if you can visualize a two axis grid where the bottom axis is the ascendance of difficulty of your game and the verticality is the ascendancy of the player's power level. If this were a straight diagonal upward line, that means your game would be perfectly balanced all the time. This is often mistaken to be the goal of game design, but what happens is you never escalate. Sure, you gain all these new powers. Sure, you eventually become immortal and you're fighting elder dragons. But since my game is so well, quote unquote, balanced, nothing ever changes. The danger and the imminence and the complexity and fear and limbic feeling of combat and of challenge confrontation, if it's so evenly matched in both player and challenge escalation, if you guys can visualize with this, me, with this with me, it never changes. It's exactly the same level of danger to be a level one player fighting a level one goblin as it is to be a level 20 player fighting an elder dragon. So you have accidentally gone nowhere. <laughs> And here is what I want you guys to see, the incredibly important nuance of escalation, which is not that it is concordant growth between player power and challenge power. It's a curve. 
It is a curve and where the curve either dips into potholes or accidentally crescendos into lumps. That is the interesting part of your game. And this is why I often say that the word balance is a false god in our hobby. Because total balance, complete balance, creates a bland sensation that undoes escalation. Okay, so there is the fundamental thesis that I want to put forward of what escalation is before we start thinking about solutions to doing conversion and other things. Escalation is the uneven growth of player power and challenge power. It's uneven. And actually, the more uneven it is, the more exciting it is, and the more you capture the limbic side. Now, the cognitive side is going to say, this is horrible. I can't have level two players going up against a tribe of spectral minotaurs. (laughs) This is nuts. They're going to get creamed. They might. That's escalation. And then the following episode, the following session, these same players who are now level three encounter a tribe of tiny, nasty rat men who are all like level 0.5. And they just plow through them. Only to discover that they are ruled by a giant lizard creature. (laughs) I don't know where I'm going with this. But the giant lizard creature is like level 12. And this is the feeling of escalation. They're worn down by all this kind of easy combat and they're thinking to themselves, well, this is blasé and I understand my limbic system is starting to flatten and then you hit them. Oh, that is escalation. Escalation is walking through the desert, encountering a few kobolds and the kobolds pull a chain and open a hatch and a black dragon jumps out and you're level one. You do not fight the black dragon. You run for your life. That is escalation. If every dragon you encounter just happens to be the same power level as your group, which is this so-called balance ideal that we are supposedly striving toward, you never get a feeling of limbic excitement, of poking and pulling at that, those heartstrings of the players. So I want you to see this fundamental truth. And then we're going to talk about The art of finding that escalation in this content you're wanting to bring into your game and preserving it and even enhancing it. Okay, let's see what's in the book here. And by the way, for for all of you guys, I I will be posting just a, a quick snappy that I took of my book entry. So I've been working on this talk for a while, but every once in a while, I'll, I'll sit down with a beer and just get all of the notes onto a spread in my journal. And, and it's what I read from as I, as I record. And it's also just how I try to find the deeper realms of the topic. So I'll, I'll post that so you guys can see the, the ridiculous mess of how I tried to think through this. Okay, so we know what good escalation is going to be. It's not perfectly balanced. So we're going to let go of that. But we're still faced with this same challenge that opened up my talk, which is like, I want to convert something. I want to convert Rapana Thuk. I want to convert that awesome starter adventure in Torchbearer with the uh, spiders in the caverns. I want to convert this, that, or the other thing. I want to do Horde of the Dragon Queen. How do I do it? Where do I begin? And, and, and man, it's like these charts and tables start expanding. So this is something that really triggered my, my game design brain is that uh, Jason Scranton, as I mentioned before, was charting out or tabling the escalation of D&D 5th edition and then creating a concurrent or parallel escalation track with ICRPG and charting it. So he would show that as the D&D levels ability boosts, feats, and other, you know, player escalation components of the game design. As they stacked up, he had another column which said our ICRPG, and he would get a concurrent piece, like add a heart, add a milestone reward, add some more loot, and so on and so forth. And then he's comparing the two and getting himself ready to do this huge converted escalating campaign in a mega dungeon, right? Which, awesome, awesome project, by the way. 
show some real creative and game design courage to attack such a project. But as I saw this table, I felt a little bit like I was swimming in this table. And anytime I feel that as a game designer, as, as, a, as a writer and book creator, I think to myself, can there be one rule which will crush all these tables away and make me never have to look at them? Can the table be a tool for me to see the rule rather than something I'm going to have to consult is another way to say it. The table is infinitely useful in its ability to reveal the game design, but to me has a very limited use in its ability to inform my game play while I'm playing. There's a big difference there. And so what I want to do is put forth two solutions, two solutions that will convert everything in one fell swoop. So whether you're bringing a Rifts adventure down into ICRPG or you're bringing the Horde of the Dragon Queen into Pathfinder, you're bringing, I don't even know, you're bringing uh, the the Lords of Umdar over into GURPS. (laughs) You're bringing Gamma World into the second edition rules cyclopedia, right? You're doing any of these things. So I want to propose two hardcore solutions that can hopefully bypass all kinds of table making and parallel reasoning. The first solution to conversion escalation. So you're not only converting your material, you're keeping the escalation of it intact. That's the key. Because if all you had to do was bring it all over and make it all match, whatever, anybody could do that. But if you want the ups and downs that make it exciting, okay, now you're talking about a challenge. So I want to propose two solutions. Solution number one, without further ado, make the word level a mathematic term in your game system. This is my first solution. Now let that sink in for a moment and see how far reaching it truly is. Take any term in your game and replace a number with the word level. Now do this widely and begin to see what happens. Okay, first there is a quick presupposition which you have to accept, which there are levels in your game. And if there aren't levels in your target RPG system, well, you're going to introduce the word level. You're going to start using it because it's your new escalation math tool. Using the word level as a math term means that I can supplant numbers with the word level. I can say, okay, you have a battle axe, you roll level D6 damage. Uh, you, you have a skill in fighting, okay, then you, uh, you roll a D20 plus level to hit. This monster is fifth level, it does level D8 damage when it hits you with its tail. This room is a fifth level room. There are level salamanders in this room. And so on, and so on, and so on. And what your task becomes is designing a curvature of level encounter and level reward. You can draw the curve first. You can say, here's the excitement curve I want for my campaign. And where that curve goes low, That means that difficulty is ascending and player power is not. And when that curve has a big lump in it, that means the players are getting super powerful and the difficulty is not really ascending. So in the beginning, for the curves that I like, you have level one, level two, maybe level three characters. But your rooms creatures, environmental challenges, and everything that works against them is level two, four, six, and even nine. Then I'm like, well, what is, oh man, well, what is the math? How much hit points does a, does a level nine salamander have? He has, he has 90, 10 hit points. You're like, Hankerin, are you out of your mind? You're going to have a third level character, which by your reasoning would have you know, 3d10 hit points, and it's going to go up against a salamander with 90, 10 hit points, who's doing, you know, 96 damage with its claws. Yes, that's exactly what I'm going to do. And it's going to be deadly. It better be deadly. 
If this is my escalation spike, if this is my limbic moment of pure terror, maybe players even fleeing for their lives, then you're damn right I'm going to do that. It is going to be ridiculously outmatching for them. All because I chose one term and I had level three, which is players, versus level nine, which is my room, my salamanders, my, my lava, whatever. Remember, too, if my lava burst is doing 96 damage, if you don't make the save or whatever, that could potentially, potentially be only nine damage. And if your player has his third level, so he has 3d10 hit points, that could be 30 hit points. The dice can still be cruel and the dice can still be kind. There's a lot of variability. But if you want the spikes to spike, then you have to do it with authority and certainty. Okay, so this is solution one. Use the word level as a mathematic term in everything you're designing and believe in that and excise everything that gets in the way of doing that step. Now, you're probably thinking, Hankerin, that necessarily doesn't capture the essence of conversion, though. You're kind of almost inventing a game mechanic. Yeah, yes, I am. Because if I'm going to do something like convert Rapana Thuk, I need a way to convert its spirit, not its math. Because I tell you, the math of Rapana Thuk is not what's brilliant about it. And you all know that. It is the essence of it, the spirit of it. If I'm going to bring a uh, maze of the blue Medusa into ICRPG, it's the spirit of the ideas that is fascinating. Not that this monk had 42 hit points rather than 46. That is not interesting. Okay, so that's my first big solution. It is a, a method level solution. Rather than focusing on this piece of content, then this one, then this escalation, then this level up, then this monster. No, it is a systemic theory level solution to conversion and to being able to easily understand escalation as you do your conversion and prepare this material. Solution number two almost sounds kind of like a joke when I say it. Um, it sounds a little bit like a troll. <laughs> like I'm almost trolling myself or trolling anyone, any poor soul who's trying to do this brilliant work. But I assure you, this is not a joke. It's the simplest way that I could write the idea. And it goes a little something like this. This is the, the calculus solution. Escalate the ratios of player capability to monster and challenge escalation on a curve that is approaching infinity. Escalate the ratios of player to monster capability on curves that approach infinity. Now, the first one was a method to convert and reduce and boil down tons of content quickly. This technique is the exact opposite. This technique uses ratios. So any given piece of content, let's say I'm talking about the bloodways in Rapanathuk, okay? I'm, I'm working on that section of the mega dungeon, and I want to capture what the appropriate danger level is going to be. So I have to surmise what level my character is going to be. There's no way to avoid that. Even with ICRPG, I need to surmise about where they're going to be. They have, you know, maybe eight to 15 pieces of loot. They have three hearts each on average. Okay, that's about where I'm at. So I'm going to need something that's going to be interesting for players of that level. Now I need ratio. Ratio is a much more complex and detailed way to create statistical nuance in what you're doing. And that means this room is about half of a player's capability. This room is about two to one on a player's capability. This room is a little less. Okay, you see how it's simple to using level as a number? But it doesn't impinge or chunkify, boil down or simplify any of the intrinsic math in either the game system of your source material or your target game system. I leave all of those conversions to be your problem. You need to understand both game systems in depth to apply solution number two. But what you're going to use as your rally point or as your campfire is the concept of a ratio. And these ratios rise and fall on this curve. Now, why is it interesting that the curve approaches infinity? What is that? You just saying that to be cool? Well, partially. Because this is a calculus problem. The top of the box 
your difficulty versus power axis, the very top of your box and the very bottom of your box become infinitely detailed in the minutia. And understanding this is important because it shows you that swaying and bobbing through the middle of the box is far more interesting. When your curve begins to flatten out at either the top or the bottom in the ratios of player power to challenge power, you start to lose dividends, could be a way to describe it. Things, another good description, things flatten out. They become infinitely close, is a way to think of it. Like that, that razor orbit when, a, when a, a starship is using the gravity of a planet to slingshot itself, right? There's a point where the, the two lines are so close to one another, it becomes minutely detailed what their difference is, and it, it loses interest, honestly, for game design. That is more the realm of rocket science. <laughs> and so you start to think in ratios, right? You start to mark down ratios, and the ratios are informing you what the rises and falls in this curve of challenge are going to be. And then you need to apply your comprehension of both game systems to say, well, how do I make a salamander that is twice as powerful as a player? Okay, well, when I look in Pathfinder, I see it involves to hit bonuses, number of attacks, hit points, amount of damage, and feats. Okay, then I'm converting over to Torchbearer and like, ooh, boy, okay, this is a little bit of uh, some dice pooling here, and then there's sort of this fatigue element. So, yikes. Okay, but that moment where you say yikes, that's where your work begins. What I want to spare you is the moment of being a little bit stuck by the capturing of the essence of the material, which to me is most importantly contained in its escalation. Now, if you think back to some of your favorite material, maybe it's Curse of Strahd, um, maybe it's Temple of Elemental Evil, maybe it's Tomb of Annihilation, um, maybe it's the, the, the ley line modules in Rifts, which were something that I really loved. Maybe it's TMNT Down Under or something like this. Maybe it's something crazy and out there. But a module that you remember where, man, was that great, how it, it kind of came and went and rose and fell, and geez, what an adventure, right? To me, what inspired you about those moments was the escalation rhythm. And this is the number one thing that I want you to attempt to capture. And so now that I've put forth these two solutions, I want to sort of talk about principles. And by principles, I mean things that transcend both solutions, things that should be giving you the mental space, the, the flexibility, the, the, the dojo room. So you can, you can jump side to side, you can jump up and down, you can flap your legs around intellectually and not worry about hitting the walls. To me, this is what principles do. They, they give us space to exercise the brain in a very active and almost wild way. And so the first one I want to say is consider the appetite for detail at your table. Now, I've talked about appetite for detail in some of my YouTube videos, and this is an important thing to understand in your players. If you're converting or creating material and you under or overestimate the appetite for RPG detail in your players, they will be disappointed or overwhelmed. People who love playing Pathfinder, love playing uh, in some ways, you know, Palladium or even Merp to get old school or even like second edition D&D. They're going to be maybe left a little bit flat by some versions of ICRPG play, right? They might want more detail than that, and that's totally okay. And the curve goes the other way, too. Some players have played a lot of complex RPGs over the years and really prefer the simpler way. Either way, it's a simple matter of understanding appetite and then targeting and building your content or converting your content to that appetite level. So keep it in mind. The second one, and this is huge. You guys, this is probably one of my biggest affirmations of our entire hobby. So if you've been sleepwalking through this talk, now would be a good time to have a sip of coffee and really take this one in. This is the principle or belief that no one wrote it right. 
No one wrote a piece of RPG content with such skill and nuance that you have to make sure you capture all that detail when you convert it or play it. No one did it that good. No map that anyone has ever drawn is so perfectly dialed and effective that you need to perfectly translate it to your table because this little corner by this door is just that important. No one did it that good. You can do it just as good as anyone ever did. And if you truly believe this in your heart, so much of our hobby will not only open to you, but will become easier. You can express yourself rather than being concerned about expressing what you perceive to be what someone else did. Now, some have written brilliant modules or brilliant pieces of gameplay. There's no disputing that. But they didn't do it so stinking good that you have to be oppressed by it. Be your own self. Find your own voice. Bring it to the table. Be inspired by those masterworks, but never be confined by them. And this will free you greatly in the process of conversion or of bringing material to your table. Now, the next one is a big one. And this brings us all the way back to the beginning. And this is my principle, which is the cognitive is the servant of the limbic. The cognitive system, the game designer, the resolver, the analyzer, the preparer is the butler of the limbic system. He, he is the cook. He is the server. He brings out the beers for the limbic system. He's on the clock. Now, this doesn't mean they're unequal in some way, like somehow the cognitive system is the better one and the limbic is like a sidecar. No, 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 no. The limbic is the reason we're doing what we're doing. And even the GM, even the so-called cognitive system, he has a limbic or she has a limbic component happening and they're having fun too. But how we use our cognitive powers in RPGs is completely subservient to how we want to evoke the limbic system. Not that we are getting cognitive satisfaction. Oh my God, you guys, you should see this weapon damage system I came up with. It is music. And you're at the table and it's like, I'm just trying to stab this guy with my spear. What do I do again? At 1d4 plus 1d8 minus 1 times 2? Because I'm on my left? I, uh, that's where the cognitive is brilliant and the limbic is just flat. You don't want that. Finally, and this is similar, I suppose, but it's my principle that if Anything you're doing in preparation or in conversion becomes uninteresting to your emotions, to your limbic side, to your, your feelings, it's going to be un uninteresting at the table. So if you're fascinated and excited by something, it will probably be fun at the table. If you find yourself slowing or slogging, it's not going to work. It's going to be un as just as uninteresting to your players as it is to you as the preparer. So if you're bogged down in any way, they're going to be bogged down. If you find yourself procrastinating because this seems like difficult work, then they're going to not want to do the difficult work. <laughs> so use your own heart as the, as the litmus test for content. When you slow down and lose interest, it's probably not that cool. But if you're flying through something and, oh, man, that's a neat idea for a room. I love how they put that lava over there. And then you ask yourself, okay, now where exactly am I supposed to put the lava? And uh, I think I'll go have a sandwich. That's where you came off. You fell off the rails because you worried about their version of it. But if all you do is catch the piece that inspired you and run on your own terms in a way that keeps your heart beating, that same effect will translate to the table. So that really is the essence of my talk that I wanted to do about conversion, about translation, about bringing to the table, and namely, in very specific terms, about the art of escalation. Now, there are four little diagrams that I just was very happy with that you'll see in the image post that will go with this episode. And of anything, I want you to, you know, pay a little bit of attention to those and look where the skull is on those little diagrams. <laughs> to me, that is the joy zone. The little skull represents where the danger gets exciting, where, where the game finds a, a hump in the curve. 
or a pitfall in the curve. And and that's when things get interesting. So if you're out there confronting one of these big creative problems, they're they're creative, they're mathematic, they're they're literary, they're they're social. Because remember, you don't get to just prepare this material, write it down and walk away. You're going to you're going to host, you're going to run this material and that is a social behavior. So the final piece of the puzzle involves having a lot of energy, being optimistic, being you know, uninhibited with your dorkiness and just going all in with it, making it awesome and making it memorable and having fun with your friends. And that, my friends, is the art of escalation. You've been listening to the RPG mainframe here at the Runehammer headquarters in the hinterlands of the Great Cascades. My name is Brandish Gilhelm. Thank you guys for tuning in and thank you even more so for your ongoing support There is so much ahead, and I, for one, can't wait to just continue to dive in. So next week for episode 12, I can't believe we're coming up on episode 12, we're going to do all mailbags. So please send in anything you could think of that you would like to make its way into the mainframe, and and let's consider that. And there's a lot more projects coming. So I know that uh, I've been a little bit slim on YouTube lately, and that's mainly because of the density of my commission work has just become (laughs) quite amazing and so that's where a lot of my focus has been but never fear rune hammer is here so strength honor and beer my friends may your dice roll high and i will talk to you soon here on rune hammer until next time